Good evening, everyone. I hope that you are staying safe, not only amidst the virus concerns, but uh, during the weather concerns that are out there uh, this evening. Uh, thankful for you and uh, your willingness to tune in and be a part of our Bible studies. I know that over time it seems like we just sort of drift into habit of uh, sort of uh, looking over these things, and I hope that that's not the case and that you're continuing to study with you and your family at home. But for our Sunday evening uh, time of study, we want to continue our thoughts from this morning after some technology issues that we were not aware of uh, and were unprepared for uh, because we didn't know about those things and some technical difficulties that were outside of our control. We obviously had some issues this morning with uploading our video and we apologize for that and we're thankful for those of you that were patient and uh, stayed in there with us and I know it was a little later perhaps than we intended, but it's still there. And if you want to go and uh, see that, you can. It's available on YouTube. And uh, we're trying to get it onto Facebook as well, but not having a whole lot of luck right now. But either way, if you would like to, to see that, it's there for your uh, opportunity uh, to view. So uh, as we begin tonight, we remind you, so many of you have been sending those in. It's been wonderful to see. But we want to continue to remind you for the next week or two uh, before we try to put something together. And then for our third through sixth graders, based on our study this morning, I hope that uh, that they were paying attention and hope that they were uh, tuned in, dialed in to our study this morning. Uh, first question, what gospel did we study from this morning? We're going to continue that study here in just a few moments. Number two, who was Jesus talking to uh, in the conversations we used this man's name several times. Number three, how many times does Pilate say he cannot find guilt in Jesus? In that uh, very short part there, just uh, in, in just a very few short moments, Pilate says this a number of times. Uh, how many times did can you find that, that Pilate said those, those words? And then finally, what color robe did the soldiers put on Jesus? As we continue our thoughts from this morning, this was the theme. Uh, from our study this morning, I Know Who Holds Tomorrow. We referred to the song written by Ira Stanfield. It's in our songbook at our congregation and probably in many songbooks throughout uh, the brotherhood and churches all over. And uh, We talked about sort of the basis for that song was this idea that we're kind of up against even now in our modern day culture, which is there are so many things coming at us that we're just not sure about. You know, things that are uh, announcements being made and it seems like there's confusion even over the people who are supposed to be the experts, they're not even sure uh, exactly what to expect or what's going to happen. And so we are sort of our idea this morning was we may not know uh, exactly what's going to happen tomorrow, but we do know who holds tomorrow. And that was our, our thought. But we want to finish that thought up tonight. We've got several, a handful of, of things. And, and just a, a quick review of our our comments from this morning as we begin. We talked about in John chapter 18, verses 33 to 36. In our introduction, we begin talking about this concept of, I don't worry or the future, for I know what Jesus said. Uh, and today I'll walk beside him, for he knows what is ahead. And that was our our introduction, which is the, the concept of Jesus knowing what is ahead. And in this time period, when he's talking to Pilate, uh, Never has it been so obvious that he knew what was ahead than in his conversation with Pilate. He first and foremost, he spoke about his kingdom. You see this here in verses 33 to 36. Uh, when Jesus confronts him after being asked by Pilate, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus confronts that sort of uh, moniker or that title and he says, did you, did you come up with this on your own or did others say it to you about me? And Pilate, in typical Roman fashion, does not appreciate anyone speaking, uh, talking back to him, even if they're right. It doesn't matter. It's the fact of, of him serving in a, uh, an authoritative capacity. He wants no part of some someone, and certainly not someone who would be considered less than him, uh, talking back to him. So Pilate's answer is not one of, of honest reflection. It's, it's, def it's defensive. It's deflective. It's... Am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you over to me. So what is it that you've done? And we spoke this morning about this, this kingdom aspect. My kingdom's not of this world, Jesus said. Um, 
he he is putting Pilate in his place, even though Pilate doesn't realize it. And that is, Pilate, you're so concerned with the empire and the things that the Roman Empire are doing, you, you, you're ignoring, you're avoiding, and you're not even paying attention to the fact that I'm telling you this is not a revolutionary tactic in the sense that I'm not building up forces to come and fight the Roman uh, army. Uh, this is a kingdom that is not of this world. And if, you, if you've if you been following along with our studies, we, we went through Daniel, the first six chapters of Daniel over the last couple of weeks. And in Daniel chapter 2, we know for a fact that was prophesied by Daniel in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar that there would be a kingdom cut out of the rock, not by human hand, but it would it would destroy all these other kingdoms and then it would set up and it would grow and, and cover the entire world. Uh, the fact of the matter is that's what's going to take place, but yet Pilate still cannot get away from the idea of a physical earthly kingdom. And that was, of course, a stumbling block uh, for many in that day. We secondarily spoke of the idea of, of what Jesus knows. He knows his truth. And, and if you and I want to be a part of his kingdom, then we have to know his truth. And that sadly is pointed out in a, in a sad way by the, the question that Pilate asks in verse 38. Uh, Pilate said, so you are a king. And Jesus said, you say that I'm a king. And, and what that means is, in your earthly terms, you think of me as a king. Uh, but I'm not a king like you think I am. I'm the king of kings is what Jesus is, is basically saying in this description. This purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of truth listens to my voice. And so Pilate does, I, again, sadly, ask that question, what is truth? And he goes back out and he says, I find no guilt in him. Again, he says this multiple times, this concept of looking at Jesus and understanding this man has done nothing to warrant uh, the punishment that's being requested by these, these Jewish leaders. And and uh, again, it was the comment was made this morning, and hopefully you were able to, to eventually listen to it, but... Pilate has no connection to Jesus. It's not as though Pilate's a follower. He's certainly not. He's as far as you can be away from that, probably. And even he looks at Jesus and just says, I don't get it. You know, what is it that, that they're hating so much about you? And it's because he doesn't understand truth and he doesn't understand what who Jesus is and what he's here for. And then we got to, to this point and, and sort of wrapped our thoughts up here in verse 8 of John chapter 19, but we want to we want to kind of expound on that and then move forward with a couple other things as we study tonight. John chapter 19, you have to appreciate, understand, and acknowledge his willingness to go through with all of these things. You begin there in verse 1, you talk about the flogging, and we won't get into uh, all the scientific detail of that, but you understand that a flogging was... It, this is where a lot of the criminals would have their life pretty much taken out of them. If they were flogged before they were crucified, or if they were flogged, period, even if there was no crucifixion to follow, many of them lost their lives due to the flogging. And here's just sort of a, a basic synopsis of what would happen. They would take you and they would put you on uh, a post with your hands above your head and typically leaning forward that way that the the back would be would be stretched out as far as it could be stretched out, and they would take this uh, this whip that was fashioned had a, a hand, handle and then leather straps that would extend out of the handle, and typically there would be anywhere from nine to twelve of those. And they would the Jews used this as we've commonly referred to it as sort of a cat of nine tails is what you might hear it referred to as. But a lot of times they when they would whip they would use that that was leather straps, and it would be uh, sort of, they would ra raise whelps. It would be sort of a reminder. Uh, they intended to cause pain, but at the same time, it was it was more of a, a punishment, a disciplinary practice done to remind you of what the whatever wrong it was you had committed. Paul had this happen to him, and he was beaten with these leather straps. Uh, but the Romans were different. Uh, the Romans took what was being used in that sense, and they they uglied it up. They took pieces of bone fragment, pieces of, of stone, pieces of, of broken pottery, pieces of glass, whatever they could find that would have some sharp edges to it and would tie them into the leather straps so that when they hit you, they did much, much, much more damage. 
and we'll just sort of leave it at that. You can use your own imagination or go do the research. I would encourage you to do that so that you understand better what Jesus went through in this this verse. It was so uh, vile and it was so horrifying. Uh, the, there's a reason why John and these other gospel writers don't go into detail about what happened to Jesus. They, they Nobody wants to write about this. And then you couple that with verse 2. These soldiers take these, these thorns, and of course you know, if you've done any research at all, the thorns, we're not talking about these small uh, rosebush thorns. You're talking about these thorns that were perhaps anywhere from um, an inch to two inches long and very, very sharp point and they would take those and they would weave those into a, uh, a headband of sorts and then they took that and they just shoved it onto his head drawing blood yet again uh, from his scalp and from his forehead and from even across his eyes uh, and then they then you have the the robe being put on him which of course would have just intensified pain because it would have begun to um, the, the blood would have been trying to clot and therefore, it would have it would have grabbed onto the robe, and then you get into these these mocking words, "Hail, King of the Jews!" and they're they're punching him, and they're slapping him, and they're shoving him. And Pilate has kind of had enough, and he goes out in verse four, and he says, "Look, I'm bringing him out that you may know I find no guilt in him." Now, they in Pilate's eyes, I don't think it's incorrect to read between the lines here. I think Pilate believes he's done enough. He's beaten him. He's bloodied him up. He's 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 injured him. Uh, he's humiliated him, and and now it, it's over. Verse five. Behold the man. It's over. And the chief priests and the officers see this bloody mess of Jesus, and they say, "Crucify him! Crucify him!" And Pilate says, "Then take him yourselves and crucify him. I, I find no guilt in him." Again, three times here, just in this brief little conversation, three times does Pilate acknowledge that Jesus is innocent. And yet, verse 7, the Jews answered, we have a law, according to the law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Now, Pilate hears this, and we mentioned this this morning in our closing comments. Pilate is more afraid. Now, to be more afraid, you have to be afraid in the first place. Pilate understands he's up against something he's never seen before. This is not uh, some riot being born in the streets by loud talkers and obnoxious people. This is not another kingdom who has risen up to try to fight you uh, with sword and shield and spear to take your empire away from you. What Pilate is up against is something he cannot explain because he truly does not understand it. In my personal opinion, this is just my opinion, but verse 9 it reveals all of that in one question. And he says to Jesus, where are you from? Where are you from? It's, it's, a, it's a panicked, um, fearful question. Where are you from? It's as if to say, I've never seen anything like you. You must be from somewhere we've never heard of. Pilate is afraid of Jesus. Even in Jesus' beaten down, bloodied, humiliated state, Pilate is afraid of Jesus. And one of the major reasons for that, it may not be the only reason, but it's one of the major reasons, is because he sees no fear in Jesus. He's afraid of a man who has taken literally their best shot, the Roman Empire's best shot, which was the flogging, the humiliation, that, that would have broken any man except Jesus. Now, Pilate says to him in verse 10, you won't speak to me because Jesus wouldn't give him an answer. Jesus is not going to, he's not going to answer that question. Where are you from? He, Pilate's not going to believe him. He hasn't listened to anything he said so far about the kingdom and about truth. Uh, he hasn't listened to any of that. So Jesus doesn't answer him. Again, fulfilling prophecy, Isaiah led uh, like a lamb before the slaughter. He was reviled. He was mocked. He was made fun of. And yet he opened not his mouth. I mean, all these things are... Fulfilling the very concept of Jesus knows about tomorrow. Jesus knows what is ahead. It, the, this is all playing into that perfectly. But I want you to notice, and this is the part we did not get to this morning, when Pilate utters the words, do you not know that I have authority? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? 
Jesus' answer tells you everything you'd ever need to know about who God is and the purpose of Jesus being here. You have it in two sentences. Jesus answers him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. It's a beautiful couple of sentences as, as much as it pains us to read because we know what's coming. It's beautiful in the sense that even in his moment where you know what's going to happen and you know how Pilate is going to react, it's amazing and it's beautiful and it's breathtaking to consider that Jesus in this moment, he's not defiant in a disrespectful manner. It is a matter of fact. Pilate, you have absolutely zero authority if my father had not given you that authority. And so he calls out those who had delivered him over in, in false accusations and sinful lies about him. He says, look, it's you, Pilate, do not understand. There is some ignorance to Pilate, even though you cannot plead ignorance. There is some ignorance to Pilate, Jesus says, but it's the ones who maliciously have put together this plot. Now, to them, it's, it's going to be terrible. And Jesus had been warning them all along, had he not? Remember those times when he says things like, uh, it was given to them a sign of Jonah, but I tell you one is, who is greater than Jonah is here now. He talks about the queen of Sheba coming to visit Solomon and being amazed at Solomon's wealth. And he says, look, there's one greater than Solomon in front of you right now. He even said things to them like, it will be better for the men of Sodom than it will be for you in the day of judgment. I mean, think about all the times Jesus has been delivering message after message after message, telling them, I know what is ahead. I know, I already know what is ahead. And attempting to teach them and warn them, and it's unfortunate that they don't listen. It helps you, the, the understanding of his willingness helps you to understand better his sacrifice. I know that you know what Jesus did. I know that you understand that Jesus died on the cross for you and I, but for us to really be moved by it, you have to appreciate, understand the willingness that goes into this sacrifice. Uh, when I was a kid, and many of you could probably attest to this, when you were playing with someone, uh, playing with your, you know, your best friend when you were in school and uh, you had a group of, you know, a pile of toys there playing, and every now and again those kids will pick up the same toy or they'll want to play with the same toy and as a parent you say and I remember being told this by my parents now you'll have to share now you'll have to share and you understand that concept of of wanting something and, and being made to sacrifice your time with it you know looking at your your friend and saying okay look I've played with it for a little while here you play with it for a little while and it's not unless you can put yourself in that situation, remembering what it was like to sacrifice, uh, that you, you know you kind of get the word. But here's the issue. Here's the difference between those two things. Obviously, there's a light year's difference. But one is a willing sacrifice. The other is an unwilling sacrifice. When you were told by your parents that you had to share, or as you as a parent tell your kids you have to share, and they do, a lot of times they're not doing that as a willing sacrifice. They're doing it because you told them to. Because you're making them. And in the case of Jesus, Jesus was not an unwilling sacrifice. Jesus was perfectly willing to go through all of this. And when you understand that, then the sacrifice takes on an even deeper meaning and it does become a more deeper emotional connection. You look at, we're just going to look at a few verses here. Verses 16 to 18, first of all, Pilate delivered him over to be crucified. They took Jesus, they went out, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the Place of the Skull, which is in Aramaic is called Golgotha. They, there they crucified him, and him with two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Verses, skip down to verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch, and they held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. You look at his sacrifice and the willingness to go through all of those things we saw in the beginning part of chapter 19. 
Uh, that's after the fact of already being lied about, being betrayed, already having to stand a, a, a trial that was a mockery and a sham from the very beginning. All of those things are happening to him. He's being he's being emotionally betrayed. He's being physically beaten. He's being socially outcast. He's being I mean all of these things are happening, and it the phrase that stands out to me is in verse twenty eight of John chapter nineteen when Jesus knows that this is now finished. I mean, it is amazing to consider that all of the emotions that Jesus goes through, all of the, the, obviously the physical pain that he's going through is immense. It is massive. It is unbearable. But the truth is, I think it is, there is that momentary uh, thought that this is it. And I would love, and, and I know this is just sort of uh, the idea, you know, that we, we've talked about things that you would like to ask or things you'd like to know when you get to heaven. And I know that truthfully, we really, there's no reason for us to even care about these things. Once we are in heaven, we will not even think about these things. But in our time now, as we study, I think about, did Jesus have a moment where even in the midst of all this terror, in the midst of all this chaos, in the midst of the hate that was being spewed at him. Was there a feeling right there in that moment, verse 28, knowing that all was now finished, that Jesus felt relieved? Verse 30, when he had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. It's not put on hold. It's not wait till later. It is finished. And with those words, he bows his head. He gives up his spirit and it's just amazing, it's moving, it's emotional to think about if you would have been standing there that day and watching. There's no way you could have kept your eyes dry to see the beauty of this mess. It would have been amazing to witness. It would have been horrifying to witness because I would have, uh, we would know that it was our sin that, that put him on that cross. But at the same time, please don't misinterpret that and think that, that Jesus was forced. It was a willing sacrifice. You get to the to the close here, verses 34 to 37. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and once there came up blood and water, he who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth, that you may also believe. These things took place, that the scripture might be fulfilled, not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. You think about John here, verse 35. He doesn't even mention his name, but he's talking about himself. His testimony is true. He knows that he's telling the truth. It's John, it's, it's so un, unreal. It's so uh, immense, so large, so massive that John even wants to make sure that people who... Uh, hear this, who people who read this, people who uh, hear it read, realize, wow, I mean, they're just taken aback. It's breathtaking. It's shocking. And John says, but I, in the midst of all that, I want you to know it's true. Remember, we talked about this. It's, it's a kingdom. It's his truth. And John says, look, you can know. You can know this. Now, if the story ended there, if the account of Jesus ended there, then then truthfully, there would be no reason for us to, to, to think about what we've been thinking about over the course of today. There'd be no reason for us to even spend time uh, worshiping. Because if there were no Jesus, if there were no resurrection, then honestly, we of all people would be the most to be pitied, right? That's what Paul said in the Corinthian letter. So that leads us to this final thought, which is the, con the concept of Jesus and his victory. In John chapter 20, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark, saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. That's no small task, by the way. So she ran, verse 2, went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. Again, John not using his own name, but we know that's who he's talking about. She said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple. They were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter, reached the tomb first. Verse 5, Stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. 
He saw the linen cloths lying there and face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead, and the disciples went back to their homes. You see, the victory, it's... This is, this is nothing to, to simply gloss over. Without this, without the resurrection, the crucifixion doesn't have the same influence. It doesn't have the same uh, feel. Because the, the Romans had been crucifying people for, for decades. And, and to, to many of them that day, not just the Romans, but many of these Jewish leaders, they assumed that Jesus would be just like all the others, the, the, the dozens, the hundreds that the Romans had stuck on this, this pole and then he died and they put his body on the ground and that was it. And yet, here it is in John chapter 20, the, the victory of Jesus. And it is phenomenal to think about that on that morning when Mary Magdalene came and she saw that gigantic stone rolled out of the way, your immediate thought is worst case scenario, something's happened. And then you go in and you see not, not something like a grave robber where somebody would have gone in without any uh, rhyme or reason and just destroyed everything. No, as a matter of fact, things are actually perfectly in order. The linen cloths are folded. They, it is cleaned up, if you will. It is, it is organized so that people would understand this is not some um, strange occurrence. This is exactly what Jesus said was going to happen. And three days after the fact, three days after his death, he is alive again. Now John says in verse 9 of chapter 20, that even, and he even admits that he himself did not understand what was going on yet. But you and I do. You and I understand that when Jesus was laid in that tomb, he was not laid there permanently. He was laid there for three days, and when he came out of that tomb, he laid waste to his final enemy, if you will. And so here's the beautiful thing about this. You think about what Jesus did with his kingdom, what Jesus did with his truth, and what he calls us to be through his willingness and through his sacrifice. What he's done is he said, my victory is your victory. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I just picked out a couple of these verses. You go and read that for yourself and and be, be moved by it. Paul wrote, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Now, okay, what's, what's, what's he talking about? What's this gospel, this being saved gospel? Verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. You get down near the end of the chapter, and Paul puts it this way for us. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But, verse 57, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that encourages you. I know because of the things that are going on in our world today, we would have much, much preferred to be all together in our typical, usual way. And, and hopefully this is just a, a reminder of uh, how we do not need to take things for granted that we have, the blessings that we have. And I hope this is a, a, a good reminder in our study from this morning and tonight uh, of what Jesus means and, and what he should mean in your life. And the fact that there is an empty tomb means so much more than just a, a geographic location. It is a change in who you are, and it's a change in your eternal destination. As always, we, we try to, to share this at the end of our studies together. If there's some reason that you would like to speak to someone about what's going on in your life, and maybe perhaps you would like to, to think, consider, or, or study more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, please do not hesitate. Please reach out. Please talk to someone. This is too important for you to simply move to the side. Uh, it is the, the difference between heaven and hell. And we want to help you more than anything. 
Uh, our goal in life ought to be and should be and hopefully is to get to heaven and take as many people with us as possible. And we can't do that. We can't do that if we don't truly understand and appreciate the empty tomb. We said this on Friday night. I told you at the close of our study Friday, uh, as we were introducing our thoughts for Sunday, it was Friday then. And one of the worst yet best things that could have ever happened to us happened on a Friday with Jesus going to the cross. But without Sunday, without the resurrection, those things don't even have the same meaning. And so I hope that you have taken some time today to appreciate that, to spend some time in prayer, thanking God for His indescribable gift, and thanking God for the victory that He's given us through our Lord Jesus Christ.